Most people think fat loss is just about doing more, more cardio, more sweat, more discipline. And on the surface, that idea makes sense. You move more, you burn more calories, the scale goes down, but here's what almost nobody tells you. There's a point where doing more actually starts working against you, where the extra cardio you're relying on doesn't just stop helping, it quietly begins taking something away, not fat, muscle, strength, shape. And that's why so many people end up lighter, exhausted, and unhappy with how their body looks. They didn't fail because they were lazy. They failed because they were never taught where the line is. In this video, we're going to talk about how cardio really fits into fat loss, where it helps, where it hurts, and how to use it without ending up skinny fat. And by the end, you'll know exactly whether the cardio you're doing right now is working for you or slowly undoing your progress. Cardio feels helpful in the beginning because, at first, it actually is. When you start moving more, especially if you've been sedentary for most of the day, your total daily calorie burn goes up almost immediately. You feel productive, you feel disciplined, and for a while, the scale rewards you. But that early success is exactly what locks people into the wrong pattern. Instead of seeing cardio as a tool, it quietly becomes insurance, a way to offset eating a little more, a way to feel in control, a way to make progress feel earned. And once cardio becomes emotional security instead of strategy, that's where the trouble starts. The body doesn't distinguish between smart movement and panic movement. It only responds to total stress and total energy demand. As dieting continues and calories drop, your margin for error shrinks. You're no longer just burning fat, you're drawing from a limited energy account. And if withdrawals keep coming without enough recovery or resistance training to signal muscle preservation, the body adapts the only way it knows how. It starts letting muscle go. This is why so many people can follow the plan perfectly on paper and still end up disappointed. They did what they were told. They just weren't told where the line was. Cardio didn't stop working because it's ineffective. It stopped working because it was asked to do a job it was never meant to do. And that realization is the turning point most people miss. At a certain point, fat loss stops being about effort and starts being about signals. Your body doesn't know you're chasing aesthetics. It only knows stress, fuel availability, and survival priorities. When cardio volume keeps climbing while calories keep dropping, those signals collide. Resistance training sends the message to hold on to muscle. Excessive cardio sends the opposite message. Conserve energy, reduce tissue that's expensive to maintain. This is what researchers refer to as the interference effect, but you don't need the term to feel it. You notice it when your lifts stall or regress, when soreness lingers longer than it used to, when your body weight keeps dropping but your shape looks flatter, softer, less athletic. And here's the frustrating part. Most people interpret those signs as a lack of discipline, so they push harder, more cardio, longer sessions, less food. That's the moment fat loss quietly turns into muscle loss. Not because cardio is bad, but because it's being used to solve the wrong problem. Muscle isn't lost dramatically. It's negotiated away, one adaptation at a time, because the body is trying to protect itself. Months of strength work can be slowly undone without you realizing it's happening, and by the time the mirror finally tells the truth, the damage feels confusing and unfair. This is where people end up lighter but dissatisfied, wondering why all that work didn't produce the body they expected. This is where high-intensity interval training changes the equation, not because it's harder, and not because it feels more extreme, but because it sends a very different signal to the body. HIT compresses effort into short bursts of near-maximal output, followed by recovery. That structure matters. It allows you to burn a meaningful amount of calories in far less time, but more importantly, it does so without constantly telling the body that energy is scarce all day long. From a signaling standpoint, that distinction is critical. Short, intense efforts resemble the demands of resistance training far more than long, steady cardio ever will. That's why research consistently shows that high-intensity cardio interferes less with muscle size and strength compared to lower-intensity endurance work. You're still creating a calorie deficit,
but you're doing it in a way that respects muscle as something worth keeping. For people already lifting weights, this matters even more. You're no longer asking your body to choose between strength and survival, you're reinforcing both, and that's why HIT becomes especially valuable as body fat levels drop and progress slows. At that stage, fat loss isn't about burning more calories, it's about burning the right ones. The goal isn't exhaustion, the goal is efficiency. And once you understand that, cardio stops being something you fear or overuse and starts becoming a controlled, intentional tool again. Once you understand why HIT works, the next mistake people make is assuming the specific exercise doesn't matter. It does. Not because one machine magically burns more fat than another, but because recovery determines whether you can sustain the process. Cycling tends to be the smartest place to start. Multiple studies have shown that compared to other HIIT modalities, cycling produces less muscle soreness and less structural muscle damage, which means you're able to recover faster and show up strong for your weight training sessions. There's also a mechanical reason this matters. The range of motion in cycling closely resembles patterns you already train in the gym, like squatting and pressing. That overlap helps reinforce strength instead of competing with it. Running and rowing can absolutely work as well, especially if you're already conditioned for them, because they also mimic common lifting patterns. The key distinction isn't which option is superior on paper, it's whether the modality you choose allows you to maintain performance in the gym while dieting. If your hit choice consistently leaves your legs heavy, your joints irritated, or your lifts regressing, it's not the right tool for you right now. Fat loss doesn't reward suffering. It rewards sustainability. And the best cardio modality is the one that supports your training instead of silently undermining it. Even the right type of cardio can work against you if it's placed at the wrong time or done in the wrong amount. This is where a lot of well-intentioned plans quietly break down. Performing HIIT before your weight training might feel efficient, but it comes at a cost. High-intensity cardio drains neural drive and glycogen, which means your lifting session suffers. Over time, that reduced performance sends a clear signal to the body that strength is no longer a priority. If fat loss is your goal, weight training still has to lead the conversation. That's why research consistently shows that HIT is best placed either after your lifting sessions or on separate rest days altogether. Frequency matters just as much. Starting with one HIT session per week is not conservative, it's strategic. For most people, pushing beyond two sessions begins to interfere with recovery long before it adds meaningful fat loss. More isn't better once stress outweighs stimulus. One of the clearest warning signs that you've crossed the line is when your lifts stall while fatigue accumulates. That's not a discipline problem, that's a programming problem. Cardio should create a small, controlled push toward your goal, not a constant state of depletion. When it starts feeling like something you have to survive, it's no longer serving you. This is exactly why low-intensity, steady-state cardio still matters when fat loss is done correctly, not as a replacement for HIT and not as a punishment for eating, but as a stabilizing force. Low-intensity movement keeps calorie expenditure elevated without adding meaningful stress to the nervous system. It doesn't compete with recovery, it doesn't blunt strength, and it doesn't demand willpower just to get through it. Think of it as the background process that keeps fat loss moving while everything else stays intact. Brisk walking, light cycling, swimming, even steady time on a Stairmaster, all work as long as the effort stays moderate. You should be able to hold a conversation without gasping for air. That's the signal you're looking for. This kind of cardio supports consistency, which is what actually determines long-term results. When people burn out, it's rarely because the plan didn't work. It's because the plan demanded too much. Too often, low-intensity cardio fills the gap between effort and sustainability. It allows you to keep progressing without feeling like every session is a battle. And that's how fat loss becomes something you manage, not something that manages you. When fat loss slows down, the instinctive response is to do something drastic. Cut calories harder, add more cardio, push through fatigue, that reaction is understandable, but it's usually the wrong move. 
Progress slows not because your plan stopped working, but because your body has adapted to it. At that point, adjustments should be small and deliberate. A modest increase in low-intensity cardio, an extra 10 to 15 minutes added to a session. Or, if recovery allows, a second weekly HIIT workout added cautiously. The goal is to restore momentum without increasing overall stress beyond what you can recover from. Fat loss should trend, not crash. A steady rate of roughly 0.7% of body weight per week is more than enough to move you forward while preserving muscle and performance. When changes are gradual, your body stays cooperative. When they're aggressive, it pushes back. The difference between sustainable fat loss and repeated failure isn't motivation. It's restraint. At the end of the day, cardio is not the foundation of fat loss. It never was. Nutrition sets the deficit. Weight training protects your shape. Cardio simply supports the process. When those priorities are reversed, no amount of effort can compensate for the damage that follows. This is why some people train harder every year and feel worse in their body with each attempt. They're solving the wrong problem with the wrong tool. Cardio isn't something you need to fear, and it's not something you need to chase endlessly. Used with intention, it works quietly in your favor. Used emotionally, it takes more than it gives. The real question isn't how much cardio you can tolerate. It's whether the cardio you're doing is helping you look stronger, move better, and feel more in control. Because if it isn't, then it's time to stop pushing harder and start thinking more clearly.